Well, today we start a new message series that I'm calling uh, The Fullness of God. And as we're uh, talking about this uh, whole idea of the uh, fullness, yeah, can you hear me? All right, there we go. Give it a little smack and everything works just fine. Uh, good rule for life. That's all I got to say. That's a good rule for life. Uh, so hopefully that you'll see the common thread throughout this whole thing is uh, the understanding of the Trinity of God. And today we're going to be taking a look at our loving Father to really understand a little bit more deeply of what that means. Um, I just want to assure you, as I'm looking at everyone's eyes right now, this is not going to be a three-part treatise on the doctrine of the Trinity, okay? We're, I'm just arranging it in that way. In fact, I don't want us to really get hung up on the three persons of the Trinity as much as I want to say, let's dig deep to see really who God is and how can we relate to that good and glorious God so our hearts can beat as one. We're, what we're really talking about here is a relationship uh, with God. We want to talk about our relationship to God is different in a way that, that uh, I would hope that we would a really be able to dig into. Now, Honestly, before we get into this, I want to take a look at some classic understandings of who God is. And uh, we're, we don't usually make this uh, a normal part of our life is to go through the creeds of the faith, but I would like us to uh, um, uh, walk through the Nicene Creed. Now, the Nicene Creed was actually written in 325 A.D. at the uh, Council of Nicaea, go figure, right? And it was written for a really good reason. At that time, there were some struggles in the church to help us understand who God really is. More specifically, who is Jesus in all this? So they answered that question in this creed. And I'm going to read it, and if you guys want to read along, that would be fine as well. But I, hopefully uh, this will be an interesting teaching moment. Uh, it starts out by uh, speaking of God the Father. He says, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. And then we move into a description of Jesus. It says, we believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us in our salvation, he came from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day rose again in accordance with Scripture, and he ascended into heaven. And he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And his kingdom will have no end. And then we hear about the Holy Spirit. And what a glorious definition this is. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. And with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. He, uh, we believe in one holy Catholic, an, an apostolic church. We believe in one baptism, the forgiveness of sins. And we look for the resurrection of the dead in the life of the world to come. Earlier today, we basically sung this in the song, We Believe. But it's good to dig a little deeper into beyond just superficial understandings of who God is, to dig deep, to really resonate with who God is. When we're talking about our relationship with God, the first point I want us to make and, and, and to really digest and to understand, and that is a God is revealed to us intimately as Abba. 
Now, I'm looking out at everyone's face and I can see recognition in some and, uh, and not real understanding in others. Uh, let me ask you a real quick question here. Quick show of hands. How many people here are fluent in ancient Greek? Hmm? Okay, got a couple. Good, good. Thank you for that. Uh, how about uh, ancient Hebrew, right? Yeah, okay, good, good. Now, this is, this is where this is where it'll really test everyone. How many people here are fluent in ancient Aramaic? All right, let's hear it for the Aramaic people. Ah, that's right. So you know what the word Abba means, isn't that right? Why don't you translate for us uh, what Abba means? <laughs> I would never do that, except he was being a smart aleck, so I had to return the favor. Now, Abba is a word that we don't use very often, am I right? Unless, unless anyone here is a big fan of Swedish 70s disco music, then uh, that's right. Everybody knows Abba from that, right? Uh, well, the word Abba is really a, a, an ancient Aramaic word that means kind of father. Actually, in uh, the uh, Bible, the entire Bible, the word Abba appears only three times. And in each time, it is written as Abba, Father. Now, why on earth would it be listed Abba, which means Father, and also in the Greek word Petros, which means Father? Why wouldn't they just say Father, Father? I think there's a really good reason for that. The reason is the word Abba does not translate very well into English. Just doesn't. So in those three instances when they are crying out Abba Father, there's a really good reason. In fact, the word Abba doesn't translate into English because it is more subtle than that. It is deeper than that. It is more intimate than that. In fact, the word Abba is such a powerfully intimate word for Father that if we were to try to translate that into English, it would be much more in the line of like, like Daddy or Papa or whatever real familiar name you have for your father. That is what we're really talking about when we see Abba, Father put together. Now, the most important point is how it's used in the New Testament. You will blow your mind when you think about this. Jesus Christ mentions it only once in all four Gospels. When we are taught, when Jesus says, uh, you know, was asked to teach us how to pray, he didn't start out by saying, Our Abba who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. No, he just used the word Father. And many times he refers to just Father. But at the moment when he is in the Garden of Gethsemane and his heart is breaking, he comes before the Lord God Almighty, he comes before his daddy and says, will you please take this cup away from me, but not my will, but your be done. He cries out, Abba, Father, if it's possible to take away this cup, but not my will, but yours be done. When Jesus' heart was crying out, it wasn't just Father. It was Daddy. The Apostle Paul mentions it twice. In both cases, he uses it almost in identical kinds of references in different books. My favorite and more complete understanding of what this means comes from Romans 8. Uh, I'd like to share it with you, not in its entirety, but in this, uh, in this paragraph. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome, and he says, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. Important to note, if you are led by the Spirit of God, you are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you received a spirit of adoption. In other words, by your faith, God has adopted you as his own. And when we cry, Abba, Father, okay, it is that very spirit, the Holy Spirit, witnessing to our spirit that we are his children, that we are children of God.
So what he's saying here is when we cry out in that same kind of anguish that Jesus cried out, and we cry out, Abba, Father, that is the Holy Spirit witnessing to us, showing us as if to say, you see, you are children of God. I'm not going to ask anyone if anyone's ever cried out, Abba, Father, because why would you? It's a foreign language. But have you ever had that heart's cry? And you cry out to God? The words don't matter. But you cry out and you say, oh, God, oh, my Father. That is the Holy Spirit of God wrapping his arms around you and saying, you are my child. I am your father. And I am with you no matter what. Keep in mind that this is not something that you can say. It's not a magic word. Uh, I would never ask anyone, next time you pray, be sure to say, Abba, Father, now. That's right, go off and be good little prayer warriors. Now, that's something that comes by the very witness of the Holy Spirit in our lives to give us that assurance that, yes, he really is God. He really is here. He's not only with us, but he's in us as well. That is that assurance that when we cry out seeking him, he says that I really am your father. I think that's a good and glorious way of trying to wrap our minds around who God really is in relation to us. So first of all, we know that we're talking about a relationship with God. Also, we're talking about here that God revealed, uh, is revealed to us intimately in the, in the name of Father, but more importantly, in the name of Abba. But what does that really look like in a more deeper way? We need to also understand that God is the perfect and true and flawless example of love. And that's important for us to note because that explains a little bit more of the intimacy and knowledge of God. In fact, uh, uh, the, the, the same writer of the Gospel of John wrote a letter, uh, wrote a couple of letters, and this is his first one. And he explains it like this, which is just such a clever way of putting it. Are you ready for this, guys? John says this, Dear friends, let us love one another. I tell you, uh, I've done Bible studies on this a lot, and it's funny how many people just, dear friends, let us love one another and kind of skate over the rest. As if to say, well, it kind of repeats itself a little bit, so that's the main point. Let's love one another. Because it goes on to say, uh, for love comes from God, and everyone who loves God has been born of God and knows God, and whoever does not love does not know God. You know, it's actually kind of confusing, and it kind of repeats itself a little bit. But, oh, please, let's see what this really means. It says, okay, we need to love one another. For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Pressed deeply into God begins to understand the very nature of God. Whoever does not love clearly doesn't know God. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to hell, okay? It means that you haven't pressed deeply enough into God to know who God really is because God is love. You know, a lot of people skate over that one, too. My goodness, think of the, the implications that God is love. God and love are not the same thing, but they go together like hand in glove. God is love. So therefore, if you know God, you will love. And if you don't know God, that doesn't mean you're going to hell. It just means you don't know God good enough. So really, you have to examine your life and say, do I really love? Because if I really love, that's a pretty good indication that you know God. But if you don't love, maybe you need to press a little bit more deeply to know who God is and allow God to change you. 
by the way, when we're talking about love, we're not talking about the kind of love the modern world talks about so much. We just got done with Valentine's Day, right? And what we often hear at Valentine's Day is the ushy gushy kind of falling in love kind of love, and like, oh boy, am I, I'm just so in love. And that's fine for Valentine's Day, you know. In fact, we're not even talking about the love of husband and wife, although we need to have that as well. In fact, we want to go even beyond the idea of love for a parent and child or grandchildren or family. We're talking about even a love that goes beyond, let's say you have good friends that you love so much, they're almost closer than family. Yeah? The idea here is you should be expected to love those people for Pete's sakes. If you don't love those people, well, then maybe you have some psychosis you need to be looked after, okay? It's easy to love those who love you. But what about walking down the street or going through the grocery store and you run into someone that you don't know? Is your first reaction to look at them and say, I love you? You may not say it out loud, this may be not in the environment, but do you think about loving that person? What about if you're surrounded by all kinds of strangers? Uh, what would be kind of the biggest environment where you're surrounded by nothing but strangers? Uh, state fair, okay? Anyone here been to the state fair in the last 20 years? Yeah? Do you like going to the state fair? Yeah? No, who said no? No, no, I'm not. You know, one thing I don't like about the State Fair is that I'm the kind of person that doesn't like to be crowded in by people. And I remember, I, I remember this vividly. I was uh, walking with the rest of the family on in the State Fair and we got separated. And next thing you know, I'm pressing up against all kinds of people I don't know and I didn't like it. So I found a bench because people aren't going to walk up next to you when you're on the bench. So I sat there and I just looked at the hordes of people. All I saw were people. So I started to people watch. Anyone like to people watch? You know what I'm saying? So you kind of look at different kinds of characteristics in people and then you realize, wait for it guys, that it isn't people. The people are made up of individuals with their own little quirks, screaming kids, Okay, this mom is freaking out. This mom's just like, it's okay. You see teenagers running around, you know, just whamming into people. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And the people get rammed into her like, or either, or, or, okay. You start to see individual differences. And this is what blew my mind. Are you ready for this, people? It just dawned on me. These aren't people. They're individuals. And God dearly loves every one of those individuals. And as soon as that thought even passed over my mind, I thought, and so should I. I should love all of those people as well. Isn't that what it says? That if you don't love... You don't know God, and I, I'll put in parentheses, enough. I'm going to push your sensibilities here for a moment, okay? Let's say I invited two people to come in here and stand before you, okay? This is not a political statement. I'm just using two extreme examples, okay? Over in this corner, we have our president, Donald Trump. And on this corner, we have Nancy Pelosi, about as far to the extremes as you can get, right? Now, I really want you to picture those two people in your mind standing right here. Can you honestly say you love them, both of them? Maybe you can find it easier to one love or the other, okay? Or maybe you dislike both of them put together. But that doesn't give you an excuse not to love the real question here is, does God Almighty, the Father of all, love them both? We have to say yes. At that point, our only response is to say, if I know God that well, I have to love them. I don't have to agree with them. Did you hear me on that? 
Disagreement is not the same as hatred, okay? In fact, you don't need to agree to like someone, let alone love someone. But we must love. If we don't love, maybe we don't know God quite well enough. My hope and prayer for each one here is that we would press deeper and deeper into who God is. Have ourselves receptive. Have our little antenna out waiting for the movement of the Holy Spirit to wash over us, to direct us. Not only for us to cry out, Abba, Father, but to have that Holy Spirit of God wash over us to, to see other people through the lenses of God Almighty. To look at other people through God's eyes and say, and know very well, God loves you. And so do I. And you don't need to prove it. You just need to love. I think that's a big part of what it is to be a child of God. Amen? So you take a look at, we're talking about a relationship with God. We're talking about God reveals himself intimately as Abba, a deep form of, of father. And we understand that his perfect example is of love. Now, here's one of the most important things that we can say about this. God seeks intimate, loving worshipers. Worshipers need to worship God in that intimate, deep, loving fashion. There's been kind of a change going on in the uh, modern Western world Christian life in the last uh, 30, 35 years. And it's been interesting for me to kind of witness that change. Early on, especially in my uh, early growing up years, you, people went to church sort of as an obligation. You went to church because it was the thing to do. You went to church to be seen. You went to church because if you didn't, people from the church would come up and ask you, why weren't you there? Uh, in fact, I grew up in the Catholic Church, but this is not limited to the Catholic Church, people. This happens all over the place. And uh, there was a point where my mom and dad made a decision that they no longer wanted to be a part of the Catholic Church. And oh my goodness, all the good Catholics from town kept pestering me. And I'm just a little kid at the time saying, uh, how come you don't go to the, to the church anymore? And I said, well, I don't know. Mom and dad aren't doing that. And I'm not supposed to give a reason. I'm just saying, there it is. And uh, you're being pushed to do what? to show up. Interestingly, over the last 30, 35 years, the, the push has been different. No longer are we sort of expected to be in church. There are no longer societal pressures to say you really need to be on church on Sunday, and if you're not there, I'll, I'll check up on you. In fact, the societal pressures nowadays are for you not to be in church. In fact, I had a conversation with someone about two or three months ago, and I was talking about, uh, about church, and he says, yeah, you know, uh, someone invited me to church, and then I got another phone call from someone uh, who said, let's go out for coffee. I'd love to. How about Sunday morning about 10 o'clock, and we'll meet for coffee? And I didn't have the guts to say that I was going to be in church. Isn't that something? When I was growing up, the expectations you were going to be in church. And now this person didn't have the guts. In other words... Basically, she said, I was kind of ashamed to let people know that I was going to be in church. The end result of that is that fewer and fewer people are coming to church out of obligation. They come to be challenged. They come to seek. They come to try to understand God. They try to come to have a more spiritual, deeper connection. And I think that's a good and healthy thing. And I think that's what it really needs to be about. And I hope that all of you are here not because you were forced to, but you know, if you were forced to by yourself or other people, at least you're wasting your time with God, okay? So there's always that. But I hope that you will press more deeply into the person of your Lord and Savior. 
I hope that worship is more than just being there, but worship is giving and receiving. Jesus had this interesting conversation uh, with this Samaritan woman who was drawing water from a well. In this conversation, they talked about many things, and Jesus slowly revealed himself to be not just a prophet, but the Messiah. And in the process of this uh, revealing himself, the woman uh, was talking about the difference between saying, hey, we, we Samaritans worship on a mountain, and you Jews, you worship down in Jerusalem. What's really the deal here, dude? Seriously. Lots of Phil Schmidt translation. You can look that up if you want. But this is how Jesus responded, which is glorious. It's beautiful. He said, yet the time is coming and has now come. The time is coming, which is in the future, which is now for us. But the time was even ripe at the time of Jesus when he says the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. They are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit. And the worshipers must worship him in spirit and in truth. First of all, people have been trying to ascertain what it meant to say in spirit and in truth for a very long time. But when we take a look at, in the context of an intimate, personal relationship with God, then we start to see it is the spirit of God that reveals to our heart when we cry out, Abba, Father. It is that spirit that, uh, that reveals to us that he is our deepest father. And not only that, it shows about the love of God when we get to know God. God more and more closely that we love in return. And here Jesus is saying, the time is coming and it's here now where worshipers will worship him in spirit to allow the Holy Spirit to help us to worship more deeply and richly than we ever can on our own that we can finally cry out to him and call him Abba, Father. And we worship him in the truth of who God is. God is love. When we worship the Lord in spirit and in truth, it means we are receptive to the movement of the Holy Spirit in our lives to do amazing things. But let's not skip over this next part where it says that these are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. When we are a church that's full of people who are actively seeking after the Lord, that we are the full of worshipers who are truly worshiping in spirit and in truth, we know that the Holy Spirit will be here because we are willing, but we also know that the power of the living God is here because he is seeking churches like that. And my God, people, when the power of the living God and the Holy Spirit are washing through a church, then we, we have to acknowledge that it's not about us, but it's all about him. And when it's all about him, the power of the living God will do things to a church that go far beyond our wildest dreams. And for some of you, you've seen God work in that way, haven't you? They've gone beyond your wildest dreams. Maybe instances, flickers now and then. Wouldn't it be great to live like that at every moment? With every breath we take, we breathe more deeply of the Holy Spirit. And when we breathe out, we cry out, Abba, Father, because we have no other recourse, we have to cry out to God. That's what it is to worship in spirit and in truth and have the power of the living God in our midst. Oh. God has revealed himself, right? As Abba, a deep, personal, intimate form we know that God is love and we are here to worship him in spirit and in truth